Hello viewers, today we introduce you to the topic wetland biodiversity part 1. Wetlands are a great resource of um, cultural, scientific, recreational and economic value to human life. Uh, in order to understand the biodiversity of wetlands, we first need to know what these ecosystems are. These ecosystems are characterized by wet soils and water loving plants. These water loving plants are also called as the hydrophytes as they love water. The wetlands are covered by water at some or at all times of the year. So in this case, the water can be seasonal, intermittent, episodic or permanent depending upon the amount of water that is present in these wetland ecosystems. They can also be defined by Mitch and Gosling in 1986, the lands that are transitional between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems where the water table is at or nearly at the surface of the land covered by shallow water. So that means they are lands that are sandwiched between two distinct ecosystems, the terrestrial and the aquatic ecosystems. Mainly the water in the wetlands can be of three types, salt water, fresh water and brackish. They are found on every continent except Antarctica. The world's largest wetlands, they are found in uh, the Pantanal, that is which straddles Bolivia, Brazil and Paraguay in South America. Most of the wetlands in the world are actually found north of the latitude of the equator, between 50 and 70 degree north latitude and these are comprised of the peatlands. So we have always heard about the peat mining aspects. So the peatlands comprise of more than 50% of the world's wetlands. As uh, discussed before, they contain hydric soil or soils that are saturated by water. They are also habitats for many aquatic and terrestrial species. So the climate topography uh, are important factors. Also the hydrology and the chemistry are significant factors which determine the soil development, that is the wetland soil development and which kind of flora and fauna can thrive in the wetland ecosystem. Now why are these systems so precious? Why are we talking so much about conserving these ecosystems? Because they are the most productive ecosystems, they provide timber, they support livelihoods, they help in carbon sequestration, they help in climate stabilization, they help in groundwater recharge. These are some of the productive ecosystems, uh, service functions that these systems provide us with. They act as sponges or kidneys of the landscape. As the term kidney indicates, they filter retain and recycle the important nutrients on the landscape helping in biogeochemical cycling of nutrients. They are also cradles or hotspots of biodiversity that they support numerous flora and fauna globally. So for example, 20% of the biodiversity in India alone is found in the freshwater wetlands and in India 70% of the wetlands are under the paddy cultivation and around 58.2 uh, million hectares is under the wetland uh, development and we find very important uh, uh, diversity for example the great Indian bustard that is found in the Thar desert or the desert wetlands of India. So from this we understand how the biodiversity uh, conservation is an important aspect by conserving these wetland ecosystems. The status of the global wetlands, so majority of them are threatened on the verge of extinction mainly due to human induced or anthropogenic interventions. In the United States of America in the past few years, 54% has been lost to agriculture, urban development, pollutants and hydrologic alterations. In Ireland, 7.5% of the uh, wetlands only remain till date and 51% have been lost to forestry and peat mining during the last three decades. Also in other European countries, there have been uh, degrading uh, statuses. In India also one third of the wetlands in the Vular Lake in the Kashmir Valley have been degraded due to siltation and encroachment practices, eutrophication and weed infestation. So uh, this happens when the water is highly eutrophic or they contain more nutrients enriched with nitrogen and phosphorus. And what happens is these uh, water hyacinths or these weeds, they actually take up all the oxygen that is present in the water. So the dissolved oxygen content in the water reduces and many of the flora and the fauna are not able to flourish because of the absence of oxygen. And the toxins that are released by these uh, weeds of these water hyacinths can be very toxic. They can even kill some of the plant and animal species. So eutrophication is a major threat which is degrading many of the wetlands in our country. The Harike Lake in Punjab is also infested with water hyacinths. The Loktak Lake which is one of the largest uh, lakes in the northeast 
uh, in Manipur. This is also threatened due to unplanned land use practices, the slash and the burn practices where the fumdis are being burnt for um, agricultural practices. Types of wetlands. Uh, in the types, we can categorize them into three types, the coastal, inland and the man-made wetlands. We will not be discussing about the man-made wetlands, but we just directly go on to the coastal and the inland wetlands. So coastal, as the name indicates, all the wetlands in wood, uh, coastal watersheds and that can drain into an estuary or a bay. India has a very long coastal uh, belt, which is around 7,500 kilometer long. You can find it along and we find here the Sundarbans of the West Bengal, the Andaman and Nicobar, the coral reefs that are found in the Lakshadweep and the, Lakshadweep and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The salt marshes of the Kutch in Gujarat and coastal wetlands in Tamil Nadu, in Andhra Pradesh, the Kaliveli wetlands are some to mention. The inland wetlands, these contain only fresh water. They are poorly drained soils. This can further be classified into lotic or the flowing water body wetlands or the lentic and the standing water body wetlands. So we will be discussing about the biodiversity of the lotic flowing water bodies and the lentic standing water bodies in this module. In India, the wetlands can be characterized into five distinct types, mainly the Himalayan wetlands, uh, which are found in the Ladakh and the Zanskar regions, the Kashmir Valley wetlands, Central Himalayas where, uh, and the Eastern Himalayas, where we find the Bhimtal and the Nokichtal uh, wetlands. The Indo-Gangetic and the Brahmaputra floodplains, coastal wetlands, as just now we discussed, the mangroves of the Sundarbans, the Gulf of Kutch, the Gulf of Manar in Lakshadweep, the coral reefs that are found in the Andaman and Nicobar. Deccan, some wetlands are found in the Deccan Plateau and the fourth, the fifth uh, type of the Indian wetland is the desert wetlands which are basically found in the uh, desert region in the run of Kutch. Run itself means salty uh, in nature. So here we find that the wetlands are salty in nature and the great Indian bustard and there are many different uh, birds uh, that are endangered and threatened or almost on the verge of extinction which are found in the run of Kutch. Now coming on to the biodiversity, you have got an idea as to what a wetland is and what are the types of wetlands, uh, what is the area and the distribution of wetlands that a country has. So in India, we have more than 115 wetland reserves and uh, more than 25 Ramsar sites. That is, these are the wetlands of international importance as designated as Ramsar sites. The wetlands serve as a home for many plants and animals ranging from the invertebrates, fishes, birds to the endangered species like wandering shrew and the great hornbill. The avifaunal diversity in uh, the Indian wetland is highest in the Ghana National Park in India which alone supports 332 avian species. Uh, giving some case studies, the biodiversity of the wetland fishes in India, this can be divided into two classes, mainly the chondrichthyes and the ostichthyes. The chondrichthyes has 131 species and the ostichthyes has 2,415 species. In this, the family of Parapsilorhynchidae uh, is endemic to India and uh, there are 223 endemic fish species that are found in India, which alone represents 8.7 to 8.8 percent of the total fish species in India and 2.21 percent of the bony fish families are also endemic to the region. Another case study is a Lanox de Moxos. This is located near the borders of Bolivia, Peru and Brazil. Here they are known for their rich natural diversity, one of the largest wetlands. And there are 131 species of mammals, 1000 plant species, 625 species of fishes and more than 500 species of different birds. The Bolivian river dolphin and the giant otter are considered to be at a critical risk of extinction. Now we go on to the biodiversity of standing water wetlands and this is a picture showing that uh, uh, of a wetland uh, which was photographed at Kerala. The first and the most primitive of the organisms are the bacteria which are free flowing and they are free living forms uh, unicellular and they are found in the benthic and the profundal zones suspended in the water columns and the sediments. Phytoplankton as the name indicates phyto means plant and plankton means small drifting organisms they can also be called as microalgae. They contain chlorophyll and they are basically the food and the oxygen providers or they help in photosynthesis. They are buoyant and they float in the surface of the waters. The main classes of the phytoplankton include the dinoflagellates and the diatoms. Examples include the blue-green algae, diatoms and the colored flagellates. 
Zooplankton as the name indicates are animal planktons. They look like animals and they float in the waters. They may or may not have a flagella. They are microscopic and they look translucent. The members of the protista like amoeba, paramecium and vorticella are found in these uh, lentic standing zooplankton uh, wetlands. The Daphnia species, they are well known for making their vertical migrations as they move to the uh, benthic regions that is away from sunlight during the daytime and they move to the surface during the uh, night time. The sponges as the name indicates are porifers or are spongy bodied. The whole body comprises of a canal system where the water flows inside and outside of the body. There are 4500 species of sponges and 25 species of sponges alone uh, are uh, different types of sponges or species are found in the freshwater wetlands alone. The hydra is the next class. This uh, belongs to the phylum Nidaria and the class Hydrozoa. They are native to the temperate and the tropical standing wetland um, ecosystems. They have a regenerative ability and they include the sea anemones, the corals and the jellyfish. Flatworms are associated with the bottom material. Examples are planaria and they live in very low oxygen conditions. Bryozoans, they live in colonies and they look like a carpet of moss. Hence, they are termed as moss animals or moss-like animals. Roundworms uh, or the nematodes, they are less than 1 cm long, can be pink or reddish in color and they move with an S-shaped uh, motion because of their uh, body movements. They are found in the bottom and the edge of the wetlands in detritus, mud and vegetation of the standing wetland ecosystems. Segmented worms belonging to the phylum Annelida. This can further be classified into two types, the Herodenia and the Oligochaeta. The Oligochaeta where you find the earthworms, they are segmented, red and pinkish in color and quite long. The leeches or the Herodenia are uh, very uh, significant or they are very important uh, um, uh, organisms that are found in these systems. They are rapid swimmers and sometimes they have this uh, ventral uh, hook or sucker kind of thing that can get even attached to the human beings and they drink uh, the uh, blood. So they are quite uh, uh, disastrous or dangerous in these aspects. They require very high oxygen levels and they are found in the clean waters. Water mites or arachnids, these comprise of the tick, the scorpions and the spiders. They are brightly colored, they can be carnivorous or parasitic and they are found in large numbers during the winter season. The crustaceans, aquatic insects and the mollusk form the next type of the uh, biodiversity. The arthropods which are, uh, they have a body which is segmented and they have a pair of joint, uh, jointed appendages. They breathe through the gills or the body surface. The examples can be from the ostracods, the copepods and the cladocerans. The aquatic insects and the mollusk belong to the caddisfly, the mayflies, the alderflies, dragonflies, beetles, snakes, uh, snails, clams and mussels. These comprise the pelicipods uh, and the gastropods. So these are important parts of the uh, mollusk uh, biodiversity. In the plants, there are two important types that is the submergent and the emergent. The submergent as the name indicates, they grow beneath the surface of the waters. They provide food and habitat and uh, oxygen for the organisms. There are three types in this, the carophyta, anthophyta and the chlorophyta, which are comprised of the stoneworts, utricularia and the green algae. Emergent uh, belong to the pondweed, the eelgrass, the vallisneria or the wolfia or the duckweeds, they are true flowering plants and cattail typha also lived in the water uh, logged soils. In addition, we find the free floating macrophytes and floating leaved uh, plants which can be rooted or which are not rooted in the um, aquatic system. Vertebrates are very important um, organisms or uh, and these can be diverse. There are uh, fishes which are 100% aquatic and they influence the ecology more than any other organism in these systems. The amphibians mainly we find the tadpoles and the frogs. The frogs are uh, the or frogs that is the adults, these are carnivorous in nature. Vertebrates, they can be reptiles, birds and mammals in, involve or include the alligators, the geese, the waterfalls, the muskrats and the beavers. The biodiversity found in the flowing water bodies or the lotic water bodies. Now here flowing itself means speed of the water is an important factor. So in the running waters, the speed of the water determines the nature of the bottom the kind of organism that can adapt to the speed and the uh, water uh, supply. The speed again determines the amount of oxygen content, the food supply and also the temperature in the water. So the organisms are streamlined so that they can adapt themselves to these fast running or moving waters. 
they have muscular legs, they have hooks and suckers on the ventral surfaces of their bodies. The head waters can be cool fast and they can be highly oxygenated. The lower sections of the waters are uh, standing, it cannot be standing but they are slow, uh, slower in, the, in their movement, they are slightly warmer and they have lower levels of oxygen. So depending on the oxygenated and less oxygenated waters, the organisms uh, according to their adapt adaptations are um, uh, thriving accordingly. The flowing water organisms can be again uh, classified into four different types, the bedrock bottom, the sandy bottom, the cobble and the pebble bottom and the mud and the silt bottom. The bedrock bottom mostly comprises of the fountain moss, the aquatic insects and the rivularia. Cobble and the pebble bottom involves the blue green algae, fountain moss, the bryozoans, fishes are really seen in plenty, the insects larvae, caddis fly, the stone fly and rooted aquatic plants. In the sandy bottoms, as the name indicates, these are sandy. So normally the nematodes, the roundworms, the planarians, the insects can thrive over here. The mud and the silt bottom, again this is also quite muddy and it has silt uh, in it or quartz and silica. They have a plenty amount of phytoplanktons and diatoms uh, and the shelled ones. Aquatic insects, rooted plants and a variety of fish are able to thrive in such kind of uh, silt and muddy bottom streams. Now coming on to the critically wetland endangered birds. So this can be classified into the migratory wetland species and the non-migratory wetland species. In the migratory wetland species, so they can migrate from one place to another, we find three categories of birds which are uh, endangered today in the present uh, day status. They include the Bayer's poacher, the Siberian crane and the spoon-billed sandpiper. Non-migratory wetland species include the white-bellied heron which we have all seen in the discovery uh, channels. So why are we talking so much and why should we conserve these wetlands? Why are they important? So these are reservoirs of biodiversity you have seen from uh, the phylum uh, protozoa till the uh, mammals and the vertebrates. There are diverse uh, um, uh, flora and the fauna which are present in these systems. So we need to protect them. Carbon sequestration is a very important uh, protection and uh, service function that they provide us with. Climate stabilization, groundwater recharge, without water there is no life. To control and mitigate the floods or they act as a barrier uh, to uh, mitigate the flood. They are valuable for the industry, for timber, for ecotourism, they support livelihoods and for numerous economic benefits. The Ramsar Convention, uh, this was adopted in Ramsar in Iran. On the 2nd of February in 1971, that is why every year, year after year, after uh, 1971, the 2nd of Feb is always celebrated as the World Wetland Day. It is an intergovernmental treaty that provides framework for national action and international cooperation for the conservation and cooperation uh, for uh, the conservation and wise use of the wetlands and the wetland uh, resources or their ecosystems in order to uh, achieve sustainable development globally. Now giving a one or two uh, case studies, uh, we have all heard of and some of us have been to also the Dal Lake in uh, Kashmir. So this Dal Lake is actually uh, polluted and the human induced interventions and uh, basically uh, because of the, the corners of these wetlands are actually um, uh, really uh, polluted and we have a number of the water hyacinths which are polluting the same. Dredging activities have been carried out which make the lake really unfit and the waters uh, have become uh, not very clean or they are unclean. And also some of the effluents from the nearby places, domestic sewage uh, from the uh, shikaras also from the houseboats, the uh, dirty waters are being uh, liberated into these dal waters. So that has become polluted. Uh, the people's participatory approach or the people have to go along with the government in order to make uh, the Dal Lake or the Dal Lake conservation plan is now going on where the government uh, along with the people are carrying out mechanized uh, de-weeding practices where these water hyacinths and the eutrophication uh, these uh, plants are being taken out and they are again making the water fit so that the um, existing flora and the fauna can thrive. Now here we find endemic plants that is we find the ceratophyllum uh, species then also the cyprinus uh, and the schizothorax are some of the fish species that are endemic uh, to the uh, Dal Lake. So this is one case study uh, where uh, it is being polluted and they contain so many species and we need to preserve them. 
Another uh, case study is that from the uh, Loktak Lake, which is one of the largest wetlands which are found in the northeast uh, of India. It is one of the largest wetland ecosystems and they support the Manipur bro antlered deer. It is also called as the Sangai, uh, which we find um, in the um, pictures whenever we see the northeast um, pictures or logos, we find this bro antlered deer. So, this is also on the verge of extinction and it is an endangered and vulnerable to extinction. Now, here again we find these um, uh, Loktak Lake of Manipur is also called as a floating lake or floating gardens mainly because the, the flora uh, actually floats over there, you find floating vegetation. Now, the people over there carry out the slash and burn practices of agriculture where these fumdis are being burnt, they are actually in the local language is called as fumdis, these are being burnt. So, they make the lake again uh, impure and unfit uh, for uh, any kind of purposes. So, again the, um, uh, this lake also is um, a place where we find a number of fishes uh, around 100 or 200 diverse uh, types of fishes that are present in this area, a number of plant species and hence we need to uh, clean the uh, Loktak lake also. So, people's participation along with the government, uh, they are doing some um, conservation practices in order to make this all right. The third case study which uh, can be said is that uh, at Mansar Lake which is found at Jammu and Kashmir, here the fishes that you find on the right hand side of the screen, uh, these fishes are not actually captured for uh, any kind of edible purposes, but the people come there and they feed the fishes every day that is why you find them, they are really very big in size, the waters are really very pure and crystal clear, neat, uh, clean. Uh, and uh, the fishes actually they are not used for any edible purpose and you find the natural flora and the natural fauna that is thri thriving in this region. So, it is actually the people's attitude towards conservation of your environment towards a system that will help in the flourishing biodiversity. The last case study which I can cite is from that of the Kutanad wetlands which is, find, uh, which is found in the south of India that is from Kerala. This is found in the Vembanad cold region. The Kutanad wetland also is uh, highly polluted uh, because of uh, the uh, anthropogenic interventions and there has been a dam that is constructed, the Tannin Mukam dam which has again caused more uh, problems and uh, this has also eroded uh, the wetlands of their major flora and the uh, fauna. Dredging activities, you find the black clams uh, which are found here which are used in the white cement industry. So, this also um, has to be from the people's participatory approach and the government together have to come hand in hand and to make your lakes uh, and the wetlands clean. And uh, in India alone, as I said, more than 60 percent or million hectares of the area are of the wetland ecosystems out of which 70 percent goes for the paddy cultivation and uh, more than 20 to 25 percent of India's biodiversity lies in our wetlands. So, it is high time that we all uh, stand united to protect our beautiful wetland environment ecosystems.